Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, our um, last session of our 10-minute uh, mentoring talks. Uh, we've had some really dynamic speakers, and um, we're so grateful uh, for our speaker today. Um, just as dynamic, uh, we're going to be talking about professionalism. And um, we have Ms. Sharon Zeely, which probably uh, is no stranger to all the people on this uh, call. And uh, she's definitely no stranger to Cincinnati. Um, Sharon Zeely, uh, as you may know, was the former uh, US attorney for the Southern District of Ohio for uh, many years. Uh, that's where I met her. And then uh, she left and she was uh, in-house counsel and chief compliance officer for uh, the Coca-Cola uh, company in Atlanta. Uh, and now she is the CEO of the Next Gen Compliance. And we are so delighted to have her today. Thank you so much for being here. And without much further ado, we will turn it over to Sharon Zeely. Thank you, Judge Cross. And thank you for inviting me. It's always nice to see uh, Cincinnati colleagues and it's good to be with you today. Um, see some familiar faces. The uh, in-house counsel job is a difficult one for many reasons. Um, I'm gonna try to cover several of those today um, in hopes that it will enlighten you. Um, if you're new to in-house, it's a good idea to spend some quality time with um, the Ohio Rules of Professional Conduct because um, the first thing I wanna cover is that firm or law firm as defined in the uh, Professional Rules of Conduct includes um, anyone working for a legal services organization or legal department of a corporation or other organization. So theoretically, um, probably a multiple of uh, rules will apply to your practice as in-house counsel. Um, theoretically, any rule may be applied to you. Uh, the first rule that I'll cover is a conflict of interest. And uh, the model rules state that a lawyer shall not accept or continue representation of a client if a conflict of interest would be created. The important thing to remember about that is that um, this rule should be read in concert with your in-house um, code of conduct because most in-house codes of conduct cover conflicts of interest. And I know uh, Coca-Cola's conflict of interest uh, section of the code was quite elaborate and covered permissions for um, using uh, company resources like a laptop. If you're teaching a class and you wanna use the company laptop to uh, prepare for the class, or if um, you're gonna use a company vehicle, certain rules apply. So um, the important thing to remember about conflicts is that it doesn't preclude you from acting on behalf of the company if you have a conflict, um, but rather you have to disclose what the conflict is and seek a waiver. And um, I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, an employee of um, PepsiCo had a spouse who was applying for employment at Coca-Cola. They would need to, um, uh, as part of the legal department, they would need to disclose that their spouse worked for PepsiCo and what division they worked for, how long they've been there, what exactly they do in terms of a job description. So the, um, the key is 
that you have to disclose sufficient adequate information for the company to waive the conflict. And it's very similar to um, working with uh, individual clients. Informed consent means that the lawyers communicated adequate information and explanation about material risks and um, any reasonably available alternatives to your serving in that capacity. And I'm not citing the rules, they're in my um, slideshow, which Maria will send out to you. I think she's gonna post it on the web or, or have some wonderful IT person to post it on the web. Um, so another rule that's important is that a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client to engage in conduct that the lawyer knows is illegal or fraudulent. And this is, um, this is a, a favorite of mine because as chief compliance officer at Coca-Cola, um, I was there during the time where there were um, many situations where um, the laws were becoming much more stringent. The enforcement environment, for example, in Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was becoming much more stringent. And um, we, we asked people in the field to call in and ask for advice when they ran into situations like that. Indeed, a lot of our training was to encourage um, people in sales and people who worked for, with uh, consultants of the company to call in and ask questions. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say I was never in this situation where someone proposed something illegal, but someone from the outside could look at a given situation and, and think, oh, there's something that I need to report to the authorities. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, people call in to the company hotline. It's not just employees. Hotline matters can be called in through, um, former employees can call into the hotline, um, agents can call into the hotline, anyone can call into the hotline because most of them are now public record. So um, you want to get a, a flow of those questions into you and let um, the employees know that they can trust you to give them good advice. And by the time I left, we had a SharePoint, we had calls coming in through the hotline sometimes um, directly to my office on other occasions and also through a SharePoint site where lawyers could ask questions of, of other lawyers um, regarding compliance matters. Um, corporate uh, compliance officers and corporate counsel have to be very careful that if you are in a situation where something that could be illegal is being discussed, that um, sometimes you have to say no. Um, sometimes you can navigate a situation so that it meets the legal requirements and also the company's objectives, but sometimes you have to say no. And um, if, you, if you don't, um, uh, make sure that you are both vocal about your advice and you fully document your advice. Um, unfortunately, you could end up named in a, a criminal complaint because that has happened um, on occasion. In, uh, in Cincinnati, for example, in um, July of 2019, a federal grand jury indicted a former compliance officer of a pharmaceutical distributor um, named Barclay, because there were red flags galore about uh, a pharmacy that was selling 
I believe it was opo opioids in much greater quantities than would have been um, would have been normal. And the uh, lawyer ignored the red flags and um, ended up being indicted. And believe me, chief chief compliance officers all over the country know about that case. Um, uh, another situation, when I say fully document your advice, um, I remember one time doing a, an internal investigation and I went to the uh, lawyer for the division that was um, under investigation for uh, an allegation. I can't remember what it was. And he said, I've been waiting for you. And he reached back and grabbed a notebook off of his um, credenza and said, these are all of the conversations and my advice specifically that they should not do that thing that way. And um, it was very helpful in the investigation. And it was, um, since he was speaking to a lawyer retained by the company, his communication to me was privileged. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. Always make sure that your law license is protected. Um, these are some easy rules. Um, lawyers can't obstruct another party's access to evidence. You have a duty of fairness to other parties, whether it's litigation or um, in other matters, um, lawyers have to tell the truth. In particular, there's a duty of candor to the court. Judge Wendy, I have to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, identifying the client can sometimes be difficult as in-house counsel. And it, it took me um, a while to make that adjustment. I think it was you know, maybe six months or a year once I left a law firm and went in-house at Coca-Cola. Um, your client is not really that um, division head that you're meeting with. It, it's not really even the general counsel you have to think of your client as being singular. Um, it's, the, it's the corporation, it's the company. And all others, including your supervisor, are constituents. That's the best way to look at it. And um, as, as many people have constituents, I would say most, uh, popularly um, politicians have constituents. They're people that you have to keep happy or at least satisfied, um, but you don't work for them. And um, when I first joined in-house counsel, um, a, a lawyer who was a good friend of mine said, Sharon, you will literally feel like you practice law half the day and the other half of the day you spend telling people who need to know what you did, what you did. And it turned out to be true. And it served me well, that high level of communication, connecting the dots, because frequently in corporations, the dots aren't connected and it can lead to problems. Um, the rules of professional conduct um, require a lawyer to distinguish not only between their singular client, but also other corporate entities. For example, um, if you are employed by the parent company, um, you would not want to engage in representation of the subsidiary, but rather um, engage with the legal counsel for the subsidiary. And those are, are and should be treated differently. There's actually a, a rule on this. I'll give you the number for this. It's 1.13. A lawyer uh, employed or retained by an organization represents the organization 
acting through its constituents. And so that is, that is a good thing to keep front of mind. A uh, lawyer for an organization who knows or reasonably should know that its constituents' actions intended or refusal to act is a violation of legal obligation to the organization or a violation of law, then the lawyer shall proceed as necessary in the best interest of the organization. So in this case, an example might be that you become aware that the president of a division is sending a lot of marketing business to a firm that employs his daughter. Um, that is a conflict of interest and it, um, it, it, it can't be um, ignored. That means that the, you are burdened with the knowledge that this is occurring and you have to elevate it within your organization to make sure that the organization is getting uh, the value that it's paying for that work. In, in some situations, that's why conflicts of interest are, are, are generally not allowed because um, in cases like that, if there's a cozy deal where a parent is trying to enrich a child or a spouse is trying to enrich their spouse, um, rarely does the company get their money's worth on those agreements. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, when in doubt, refer the matter to a higher authority. Under 1.13, elevate, elevate, elevate. Again, make sure your license is protected. In terms of um, attorney-client privilege, um, that is, it, it is an interesting dynamic with, when you have a singular client because the only way that information comes to you is through the constituents. So that is still privileged. And in that, um, Rare instance, of course, any communication that you receive as a company lawyer is privileged and confidential, with some exceptions, uh, including a violation of law. If you um, are new to private, um, new to corporate counsel, and you just left private practice, you may be licensed in a state. Um, other than the state where you now work for your new company. In those situations, it's best to have a lawyer from that state um, advise you in anything that relates to the direct giving of advice until you can seek reciprocity. Um, a lot of what in-house counsel do is not um, it's, it's a blend of business advice and legal advice. And in those cases, a lawyer is typically being asked the question because um, they're both a lawyer and they have good judgment and they know the business. So the lawyer can give advice in situations um, uh, like that on a temporary basis, but the the best avenue is to, um, to be licensed in the state of the company because how else will you be promoted to general counsel? You have to be licensed in the state. Um, lawyer as whistleblower. This involves multiple um, rules of professional conduct. And there have been some situations where this has happened. And I save this for last because it's, it's that sticky. It involves um, confidentiality of client information. It involves organization as a client. 
It could involve reporting professional misconduct um, by other counsel, disclosure laws, and employment laws, because as inside, inside counsel, you are an employee of the corporation. So um, in, in one case um, called the Cohen case out of the second district, the lawyer uh, was a whistleblower and he reported uh, alleged misconduct in the company and um, that, that case really didn't go anywhere. Um, the most um, important case is a case called Wadler out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, this involved the lawyer raising issues related to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which is um, the anti-bribery law in the US prohibiting companies from giving anything of value to someone um, who is a foreign official, meaning a non-US official, in exchange for obtaining or keeping a commercial advantage. Um, an example might be the uh, payment of a telecom company to a government official to win a government contract to set up telecom stations all over a, a city or a country. In the Wadler case, the jury took three hours and came back um, with uh, $2.9 million in back pay and $5 million in punitive damages. I believe that's still on appeal, but it's something to keep in mind because it did involve something that, you know, the FCPA is the, the, a third rail in corporate America because the penalties are so strong. And um, there have been executives, there have been um, lawyers that have served as whistleblowers. So that's that's tricky though, and not something that I would ever ad advise without direct legal counsel um, who's knowledgeable of not only all of the rules, but employment laws, etc. cetera. Um, there was a, a third case. Um, I'm not sure if this ever made it to court, but it was reported in the New York Times. The Hershey Trust, which is the Hershey uh, Chocolate Company, um, they have a trust that employed um, SD, and SD uh, attempted to um, allege wrongdoing, but he was later fired after he pled guilty on unrelated um, federal wire fraud charges. So things can get really sticky quick. And um, I think that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to um, take any questions that you have or to uh, invite Laura to serve on the panel with me to answer your questions since she's the expert. <laughs> Judge Cross, you're still on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon, for uh, your presentation. It certainly is robust with information. Uh, we're gonna ask everyone at this time to turn your cameras back on. And uh, if you, we're gonna open it up for questions. And so this is a time, uh, if you have a question, please uh, either put it in the 